Good evening, everybody. Today is Monday, December 17th, and this is a regular Moscow City Council meeting. Catherine? Um, please join staff, council, and the mayor for the Pledge of the Flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Catherine. We'll move on to item number one, which is the consent agenda. Your Honor, I move that we accept the consent agenda as presented. Second. Okay, we have a motion by Gina and a second by Jim to approve the consent agenda as is. I'll start the roll with Catherine. Aye. 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 Okay. We will move on to item number two, which is staff recognition report. Gary, do you have anything for us tonight, sir? No report tonight. No. Okay. Mayor's appointments, and I have uh, 24 <coughs> reappointments that I am going to list and, and uh, talk about for council's approval. And we'll start off with Farmer's Market Commission. There's two. We have Jenny Ford. Her term would expire on 1231 of 2021. She is a chamber rep. Uh, Jamie Hill, uh, term expires 1231 of 2021, member at large position. We have one on the Historic Preservation Commission, and that is Jack Porter. Term expires 1231 of 2021. We have four on the Human Rights Commissions, uh, Rula. Rafferty and Aaron Agidius, both that expire on 12-31-2021. Eric Carter, who is uh, he is a high school one-year non-voting position, ends at 12-31-2019. Elizabeth Stevens, whose term expires 12-31-2021. Moscow Arts Commission, we have two. Lauren McCleary, who expires on 12-31-2022, as well as Donna Woolston. Same expiration date. On uh, Moscow Pathways Commission, we have two, Robert Heckendorn and Aaron Bacon, <coughs> both uh, expirations at 1231 at 2021. Parks and Rec Commission, we have uh, three, and it's they all expire on 1231 at 2021. Damon Burton, Ted Kisha, and Sarah Zasky. On planning and zoning, we have two with expirations of 1231 and 2023, Mike Nelson and Victoria Seaver. We have three on Sustainable Environment Commission uh, that ex all expire on 1231 and 2021. Kevin Booth is a college one-year voting position, uh, Victoria Seaver, as well as Russ Moore. In Transportation Commission, we have two that expire on 1231 and 2023, Ben Calabretta and Phil Cook. Tree Commission, we have two that expire on 1231 and 2021, Daniel Cronin and Lauren Goss. And on the Moscow Urban Renewal Agency, we've got Ron Smith. Term expires on 1231 and 2023, and he is a member at the large position for a total of 24. And I would entertain a motion from council to prove this. So moved. Second. Okay, we have a motion by Jim and a second by Gina to approve all 24 of uh, these commission appointees. I'll start to roll with Brandy. Aye. 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 Aye, and thank you volunteers for being on our commissions. And we have several of them. I, I know that are here. I know we got Jenny Ford, and of course we got Victoria Seaver, who is on two of them. Is there anybody else besides those two? Would you, would you please stand? Would you, Wendy McClure, please stand. I want some recognition out of anybody that serves on these commissions, so everybody can see who they are. Yeah. And, and if you'd like to speak for a minute, you're sure welcome to at the podium. You don't have to, but. <laughs> Uh, I always like to talk, so I never pass up the opportunity to allow somebody else to do that as well. But uh, one of the key things that's very, very important uh, for any city, and clearly for our city and myself as the mayor and these counselors up here, is the men and women that serve on various commissions because it's the volunteers that make it 
are really big for us and really help us out and it's very much appreciated by myself and all of these up here so again thank you very much Okay, with that, I will move on to uh, item number four, which is public comment, mayor's response period, where we allow people three minutes, uh, ask them to provide us their name, and tell us what's on their mind. So, if we have any, as long as it's not on this evening's agenda or something that's in front of planning and zoning and or board of adjustment. Okay, well with that we will move on to item number five, which is our, one of our city commissioners report and on Historic Preservation Commission. We've got Bill Belknap as well as Wendy McClure here. So Bill, you have the podium. <coughs> Thank you, Your Honor. My duty this evening is fairly easy. It is merely to introduce Wendy McClure as chair of the Historic Preservation Commission. Wendy has been chair of the commission for the last several years and has done an outstanding job. And so I will turn it over to her. And before Wendy gets started, I'll, I'm going to um, give her a shout out too, because she chairs two commissions, P and Z as well as this. So thank you, Wendy, and good evening. You're welcome. I, I knew you'd hear from me, so I just <laughs> <laughs> one way or the other. One You're way or the other. So I'm going to start out just by passing these out. <coughs> the insert that you all did. First of all, thank you, Bill, and uh, for filling in for Mike and, and uh, Mike Ray, who is our, our normal council, I mean, city liaison, excuse me, city staff liaison. But I'm um, Mr. Mayor and fellow, I mean, not fellow, uh, counselors. Uh, um, I'd like to give you an annual report on the Historic Preservation Commission and what we've been up to since last time I spoke to you. Um, well, we've f filled out with a few more members. Uh, our latest uh, member is Jared Norman, who is an archaeologist for uh, uh, several tribes and, and brings a dimension that we haven't had before of expertise that we're looking forward to. He's been with us now about two months, I think. Um, and uh, Sandra Kelly is re relatively recent, but since she was elected, uh, I, th I think she started at the beginning of the year, so she's another one. Um, and we have one vacancy that we're hoping to fill in uh, some reasonable amount of time. Um, so if you know anyone who wants to serve, we'd love to have them join us, especially if they bring an expertise in an area we don't have in preservation. Um, so, moving on. Whoops, uh-oh, Bill, I just did something that I shouldn't have. Came back. There we go. <laughs> okay, so what you have, uh, what the city council members and mayor have before them uh, is actually a copy of our uh, one of our annual projects, um, which is to produce a, a eight-page newsletter that um, we actually work with a contractor on it. Bob, uh, Barb um, Coiner has been our contractor for the last several years. Uh, and this year we decided to focus on porches. What did porches bring to Moscow historically and, and today? And uh, um, Brandy's been seen across, I think she might even be in that little Ryrie Brink house mm -hmm. uh, photograph, I'm not sure, <laughs> I can't see from here. Yeah, but anyway, because she lives right across the street and they have regular gatherings on that porch as does Tim Kincaid on his porch and, and others that you see featured throughout this, um, this issue. Uh, and so it's, it's always fun to put together. And that's probably a, one of our biggest projects of the, uh, that's an ongoing one. Another ongoing project is uh, uh, we, uh, we um, identify throughout the year different projects that seem to merit uh, excellence in one form or another in uh, historic preservation. And so uh, what you see it, um, on the upper left is a stained glass replacement project, restoration project for uh, St. Mary's Church. On the right there, you see uh, the University of Idaho did a beautiful job of bringing their uh, <laughs> wonderful stairway uh, in the at administration buildings. Um, uh, let's see, that would be the eastern entrance uh, up to fire code without uh, having to to, they enclosed it in glass, basically, so they could preserve the height of the railing and keep it aesthetically uh, and historically correct. And so it's, it's, it was an amazing project. We have Coulter Creek Winery downtown with its renovation, bringing some another layer of excitement to downtown. 
And um, we have, um, unfortunately, <coughs> I can't see him from here, so I should probably get an issue <laughs> back. Um, but we have Nels Reese's porch, which was um, restored um, um, by, um, and, and we awarded his carpenter. And we have um, a house on, um, on Van Buren and um, a Street uh, across from the, the Day Mansion, which uh, did quite a bit in terms of restoring some of the porch that used to be on the house uh, in a somewhat different form, but they use it all the time, and also um, some other um, projects like window restoration. And then, um, and so I think that, does that give us all of them? Uh, I probably skipped one. I don't know. Um, yeah. Oh, I, yes. I, okay, we have Culture Creek Winery, and that's the interior shot. I couldn't really read it from here. Um, all right, so the next one. Um, our, an ongoing project that's been a multi-year project is our inter interpretive signage program. Initially, we uh, targeted institutional buildings along th the Third Street corridor, uh, slightly off of it, obviously, with the Carnegie Library. Our first uh, project will go in soon, hopefully if the ground is soft enough in January. We're hoping to install a sign in front of the 1912 Center up in a planter bed. Um, and then next to follow will be City Hall. That, that sign in its final form needs to come through City Council first. Um, and also, um, and then we'll move on with the library and, and uh, the church. And, and while I'm thinking of this, I completely forgot to thank Brandy Sullivan, who is our council liaison. <laughs> and please forgive me for get, forgetting that, Brandy. Um, anyway, this is the... Um, um, sort of design of the stand on the left, that will be uh, on all but the, um, actually the sign going in front of the 1912 Center because it, its stand will be mostly concealed in a planter bed just to the left of the east stairway leading up to the um, south side of the building. Um, so, the, and then what right now we're in uh, doing final edits on the Moscow City Hall poster that will come through um, to you all in the next few, probably next month or in February. Um, anyway, um, another uh, future looking out there project is uh, working with the University of Idaho in consideration of a, a, a campus historic district featuring the core of campus buildings. Uh, so uh, um, Nels Reese and I have met several times and, and Mike Ray with um, uh, with um, facilities staff, including Ray Hancock and um, Pankoff, excuse me, and um, uh, Brian Johnson, who are in this photograph. And uh, we also, uh, uh, this fall, we had um, staff from the Idaho State Historical Society come up to campus and tour it with us and talk, and, and we had a conversation about the possibilities of this district, which would be our third district in the, in the um, city of Moscow. And that's pretty much all we've got to say. Does anybody have any questions? Well, I got a couple of comments. I'm sure some other folks up here do too, Wendy, but those interpretive signs are very, very nice to have these so that people can get a chance to take a look at them, read them, not only our citizens, but folks from out of town. And, and the nice signs that we have now, I've got had lots of comments from people that talk about those very things. and. And so it's pretty neat to see. Great. We hope it'll, uh, you know, enhance what the city has already done it with mm -hmm. uh, um, identifying City Hall and, and other buildings in different ways. And this adds a layer of explaining history. So, and also, the, um, uh, it, most importantly, how the buildings have been preserved and adapted for uh -huh. their current uses as yeah. well. So, Absolutely. Brandy, so do you? Uh, I, I have really enjoyed being the liaison to the commission and you all have uh, so much expertise and ideas and I think uh, the number of things that are in discussion for the future too is um, pretty incredible and a lot to look forward to that your commission will add so well thank you thank you and thank you for supporting us this year so we appreciate it one other thing Wendy don't run off quite yet uh, I wanted to talk to you about the uh, the district the university district a couple of years ago I walked up with Nils, and I walked, geez, he walked me all over the, and I'm a pretty good walker, actually, <laughs> and I was kind of surprised that he could keep that pace, but we went through every single building, and of course, Nils is an architect, I tell you all about right. the different right. 
I mean, you know, designs and stuff. So it was very much an enjoyable thing. Him and I spent about three hours walking through all that, and I really enjoyed it. So he gave quite a tour of that. So well, we we also feel that I mean, there are quite a few of those buildings that are already on the national register mm -hmm. individually. But to create a district, we feel it'll help incoming students as a recruitment tool to really understand the the place they're studying and help the city too in terms of its strong ad, ad, you know identity with the university so absolutely we hope uh, so i'm yeah. glad you got a tour from nels it's oh, always, yeah. <laughs> always quite an experience yes, it is. Yeah. well thank you very much all of you thank you wendy again <laughs> oh. okay <coughs> we will move on to item number six which is gotcha mobility bike share program Tyler Palmer is here uh, with us this evening. Hello, Tyler. Mr. Mayor, Council, thank you very much. And I actually have Becky Couch who will be accompanying me with the University of Idaho to help answer and field any questions as she's really been uh, kind of the driving force behind this effort. Uh, very happy to bring this forward. Uh, this is a program that we hope will turn into a really great way to tour some of those historic districts that we have. This is a, a bike share program that uh, several of the people on City Council have, have been involved in the formulation of this as we've really tried over the last couple of years to, to develop what, what would be a sustainable bike share program for the City of Moscow. Um, the bike share industry has undergone a really rapid transformational change over the last several years, but especially in the last year as the scooters have become very disruptive to the entire bike share system. And so as, as the City of Moscow looked over our options and really analyze the options for the bike share program. Something that we wanted to take into account is that we wanted to have something that was sustainable, something that met the needs of the community, but also something that we could assure would be safe and, and something that would be very user fr friendly for, our, for the people in our community. Um, as we've seen, e-bikes become very popular. That's another thing that really started to change um, the way that people interacted with these bike share programs in a pretty exciting way for a place like Moscow where we do have hills. And a lot of times the obstacles for mobility for people on a bicycle is, is the hills and the challenge that somebody might have making it up and down the hills. So after a lot of research and, uh, and having... <coughs> identified at one point uh, a company that we thought would work and then we had a contract the university did and they were going to come in but then at the last minute they dropped off because the scooters came and you know it turned into a whole thing we've identified a company that we think their model works a lot better for the city of moscow and for what we're targeting we think it's a more sustainable model um, it's gotcha mobility is the name of the company uh, they are the company that has run pullman's bike share program for quite some time um, the advantage, the, the reason we believe that this company is advantageous for the city of Moscow is that it does require an investment by the community. Their model is a sustainable model. Uh, for example, there's not a single scooter model out there that is profitable. They're, they're, they're all subsidizing pretty heavily the scooter models, trying to get scooters into communities, and then, you know, the idea being that once they have that survival of the fittest with the companies then the rates will start to come up into profitability and so that's really been disruptive but uh, Gotcha has a model that we think works better um, they have a, a fee that is paid per bike per month um, and that's a fee that that we're proposing be shared at this point between the city and the university um, and for that we get we get a fleet of e-bikes and and so the the pilot program that's before the council today is a is a program where gotcha would bring 50 e-bikes to the city of moscow and they'd be placed strategically throughout campus in the city um they they would uh the, the 50 e-bikes is, is what is a guaranteed functioning number and so for, for the for the cost that we pay we're guaranteed to have 50 functioning e-bikes out and so when they come they'll actually have more bikes than that um, and then gotcha has several different models that they use to maintain the bikes but they're responsible for the maintenance and the placement and repairs and everything of the bicycles um, sometimes they contract with local bike shops sometimes they have a local employee a lot of it just depends on the scale and then through the process of a one-year pilot, we could really find out a lot about usage. And so the idea is that we, we have this pilot. We think that this is, this is a, a somewhat conservative pilot, maybe, but it puts enough bikes out there that we can get an idea for adoption levels and then have a really good, use for, good, good idea for who's using the bikes, where they're using the bikes, and then appropriately scale the program. Um, 
so that's what's before the council today. I'm going to let Becky add anything that she can see that I've I've missed, and uh, and then we'll invite Jacob Lockhart, who is here representing the ASUI. He's a senator with the ASUI, and we'll have him give some comments, and then we'll be happy to stand for any questions the council might have. Thank you, Tyler. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. So um, <coughs> just want to um, say that I'm very excited to be here, very excited to be talking to you at this level about a gotcha mobility program for Moscow. Um, I think, as you know, we've been talking about this for a very long time. Les and I have been working together closely on this for more than a year, two years now. So it's very exciting. Um, I particularly am attracted to Gotcha Mobility because they are com they they commit to the communities that they come into, um, and they're focused on complete mobility. So they have um, they're they're very unique in this industry in that they have three mobility options that they offer: the the e-bike, an e-scooter, and a an rideshare service. So we hope to in the future discuss those options as well. But right now we ju are just talking about the e-bike program. Um, they are focused on coming into communities and working on your transportation goals, not just coming in and making money. Um, that's the difference I see in them in the other companies that we talked with. So that was very exciting and attractive to me in their company. Um, and then I just want to thank you for your support and all the time that we've spent talking about it. Um, the university is very excited about this. Um, parking and transportation in, in particular is working on a vision for campus to become a university where a vehicle is not, a personally owned vehicle is not required for a student in order to meet their mobility needs to come to college. And in order for us to come close to that vision, we know that we have to grow alternative transportation options in the community. We have to enhance the ones we already have, get more people using them and aware of them. And so this is one step we think that will help us work towards that vision. So very appreciative of all the time many of you have taken to um, work on this initiative with us. So. Thanks a lot, and I'm available for any questions um, after we let Jacob talk. So come on up, Thank Jacob. <laughs> well, I have a little thing written out. Hello, good evening. There's a lot that's already been said, so I won't really repeat all of that. But I do want to read something I've written out. Um, as before stated, I'm Jacob Lockhart, and I have the privilege of serving as an ASUI senator. So I'm elected by the student body every year to represent the students, and that's what I'm here to talk a little bit about. Um, tonight, really, essentially, I'm here to urge support for the Gotcha Mobility Program. Um, this particular initiative is one that I'm particularly um, passionate about. I personally am not necessarily passionate about bikes, but I am passionate about how this program can positively benefit our community. I speak from a place of privilege in the fact that I do have my own automobile that's accessible and convenient to me whenever I need it. Uh, with this privilege, I've been able to interact and engage with my community with relative ease. In large part, my success as a student here has been because of that privilege. I recognize this, and I also recognize that this is a privilege that not every student or community member necessarily has. Um, access to transportation essentially to me means freedom to engage and succeed in one's community. Gotcha Mobility has the potential to provide access to transportation for those who might not necessarily have access to a car or a bike. Uh, this in many ways can be a barrier to success here in Moscow. In other words, Gotcha Mobility has the potential to overcome a barrier and to give students and community members alike the ability to engage and succeed. That's why I'm passionate about this particular program. This is not to say that the city of Moscow is devoid of public transportation in any sense. Uh, instead, this is to say that whenever an opportunity presents itself to provide more forms of alternative transportation, we should be eager to do so. By providing gotcha bikes to our community, we can expand our systems of alternative transportation and simultaneously expand our access to the community. <coughs> the city of Moscow, in my experience, has always been unique, attractive, interactive, vibrant, affordable, and because of my automobile, accessible. I believe that this program has the potential to allow students and community members the opportunity to experience all that the city of Moscow has to offer. This is because I believe that Gotcha Mobility will encourage the use of sustainable and alternative transportation. A bike share program has many benefits, such as getting a group of friends downtown rather than staying in their dorm or their apartment, uh, to get a student to work who might not have a car, or, or even provide a recreational outlet on a sunny day. A bike share program serves to benefit everyone in the community, and even those who come to visit on special occasions, such as parents' weekends or vandal game days. The point is that whatever it is, for whoever it might be, Gotcha Mobility can provide that opportunity where there might not have been one before. And while we have not had a bike share program like this before, there's never been a better time like the present. 
There may be learning curves, of course, but I'm confident that whatever challenges that we have, we'll be able to <coughs> handle those with collaboration and innovative problem solving. Gotcha Mobility is dedicated to providing a comprehensive system. It's also educational and safe, as we've seen. Together, we can make this program work to the benefit of the community to fit our needs. The University of Idaho and the associated students of the University of Idaho are eager to finance half of the necessary funds to make this project a success. Tonight's action item is a big, is a big ask, I know that for sure, um, but ultimately the future of the initiative lies with you all in the community. Um, it's my hope that the city will join us in that initiative, that we can expand the opportunity to engage and succeed in our community for students and community members alike. Thank you for your time, I really appreciate it. And if there's any questions on behalf of the students, I'd be happy to answer that. Yeah, thank you, Jacob. Thank you. So uh, before we open it up for questions, just, just kind of as a, as a recap of, of what's being asked here, the, the bike program had, a, there were two options. There was a branded option where you could pay for a branded bike, which, which ended up being about $25 more per month, about $100 per month per bike. And as we looked at that, we really didn't think that that was worth the additional expense just to have a branded bike versus a, a gotcha branded bike. And so uh, we're proposing the, it's $75 per month per bike for the 50 bikes, um, which comes out to $45,000. Uh, and so the proposal before the council is for the city to fund uh, about half of that, uh, or I guess not about, but half of that, that funding. Um, and one other thing that, before, that I'd like to mention is that one, as part of Gotcha's program, they send, um, they send a team to help to help find corporate sponsorship for the program. Um, and so we, we're looking to fund the program in its entirety between the city and the university, but then any corporate funding that they're able to generate would then diminish the city's commitment to the program itself. And, and from what we hear, they've had a relatively high success rate finding corporate sponsorship for programs to help offset costs. So with that, we would stand for any questions. Okay, I'll open it up here. Oh, Brandy. oh well just <coughs> with the, what you just said too. I from earlier discussions, I think Rebecca said that there's 90 days from the signing for the pursuit of sponsors, and that the understanding is any sponsorship would decrease just the city's portion. So it's really you're asking for up to 22,500. Yes, nice. yes. So we're looking to have the commitment to fund the entire 45000 initially. Mm -hmm. And then I think the idea would be to then look for sponsors to come in later. Um, I don't know at what point they would. It, to me, it seems like after the pilot period would be when the sponsors would kick in. Um, if we were looking to just fund the program halfway with sponsors or completely with sponsors, we would sign a contract and then have 90 days for them to help us secure the funding. Um, we're kind of looking at it in a different way as finding that commitment for the funding so we can get it going on the ground, um, find sponsorship to help maybe help it grow later when we need to add new bikes or or whenever we happen to get those sponsors. Does that answer, does that make sense? Well, so do you mean that you wouldn't try pursue the sponsorship until after the pilot year? Is that what? No, I think we oh, start okay. pursuing it whenever we're ready. But yeah. you just need to know that. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. We would commit to that yes. full amount if there is no sponsorship. Yes, and, and I do believe it will reduce the city's portion. Um, University is absolutely committed to the 22.5. Um, I don't mm -hmm. I don't have any expectation of that decreasing for the university so Catherine? Carol, it came to Public Works and Finance and that committee unanimously supports the idea I just would just like um, some more information about so that people can understand how the users can use this would you kind of give them some details mm -hmm. so the proposal they've given us for the 75 a month includes um, university affiliates so anyone with a uidaho.edu email domain is allowed to have 30 minutes of free ride time every single day. Um, other community members have the option of purchasing memberships, um, and I haven't seen exact membership plans from them yet. Every time that we talk about that, it's the, it's very um, <coughs> customizable. And so m one example they've thrown out is $100 for the year, and you get 90 minutes of free ride time every single day. So it's they say it's very much dependent on what your community needs are. Um, so however we think citizens might use this, we can customize the membership options for that. Um, if they don't want to do a membership option, then it's 10 cents a minute. So they've, I've seen on their website it says 15 minutes for $1.50. Um, any, any U of I person who goes beyond the 30 minutes in a day will pay the 10 cents a minute. As well. And then explain a little bit more about that because there's not any, um, the, the geofencing and the... Yeah, do you want to? Yeah. 
So, so you know, one, one of the traditional problems with bike share is, is uh, when they all started off around the country, they were docked systems, and so there were specific places that you had to dock the bikes. Um, the dockless systems are very nice because it provides the flexibility to actually leave the bike where you're going or closer to where you're going. Um, but then with that came the challenge of people leaving bikes where you didn't want them leaving bikes. And uh, so it, it comes with the new technology that's come out, there's, there's a lot of, ab um, of ability to do geofencing, which means that they can basically get on a map and say, we, we don't want bikes parked here and we don't want them here, but these, this is okay, this spot is okay. And with the bike's internal GPS, it knows where it's at. And so it won't allow a ride to be terminated in a place that it can't be terminated. And so that allows us to really help control what otherwise could be kind of a cluttered situation. Um, so that's, that's a really nice feature. And, and, and one other thing that, that I thought was attractive, as, as uh, Becky mentioned, there are a lot of different pricing options, and so as we get through the pilot and we start looking at this, we, we could take a look at having, you know, potentially subsidized rates for low-income people is something that they've done in other communities where, where you make that really cheap and really accessible, um, you know, just different, a lot of different pay structures that as we look at the specific needs of our community, we can work to try and customize something that works. Gina. Help me understand, if you would, please, and I think this is probably both of you. Um, you just mentioned a piece that I didn't hear at the Transportation Commission the other day, and I just need some clarification. You just said that there is a .edu or uidaho.edu benefit everybody gets because... So, so what happens with the city? So, so the, the university students, university affiliates, so anyone with... They have a closed system. So where they have a closed system, they can provide that benefit to the students. And so anybody... And the staff. And the staff. So anyone with a, with a .edu, with a uidaho.edu okay. email address would then have a 30-minute daily credit toward a ride. Okay, but only to the university? Only those with that email address. Oh. It, and we had discussions with them about that through the process about, well, okay, is the, are there ways to do it otherwise? And it, it gets really difficult when you don't have a closed system. So the reason that, that they're able to do that is... It, it's being supported through the student fees, and they have a closed system, and so they can they can identify who those users are readily. Tyler, I got a question for you, <clears throat> and it might even go back to Becky on the sponsorship, uh, going out and getting sponsorships once this thing gets going. Who does that? Who maintains that? Becky, is that part of your job, or would um, you explain that, please? I would certainly be involved. I think the city partner would be as well, but they have a dedicated team, a sponsorship team, dedicated to coming in and helping do that. So, uh, gotcha. Gotcha. Does. Yes. Yep. Yes. Okay. So I understand that we would help them identify who those sponsors might be and maybe get them in contact and go meet with those people or perhaps with them, but they have a team dedicated to helping you with that. Catherine? Can we explain more about the safety with the helmets and the age limit and yes, um, bit? So they're very focused. They'll tell you they're absolutely committed to safety. That's probably one of their top three pillars. Um, and they they have a helmet program where they will give out free helmets at launch. I don't know the number on that, but um, they will sell helmets to their university or city partners, whoever their partners are, at reduced at their cost rate and really good helmets so that then the city partners, community partners can give them out however they see fit in the community. Um, the age limits, I think um, you, you just have to have a credit card in order to be able to create an account because you have to attach a credit card to it for fees. And the, the age limit as far as riding the bike, I believe is 13. And um, it also will just be driven a bit by ability to ride the bike um, because they are larger bikes. And you can rent more than one bike on an account. Um, you can so if you're if you're a parent and you want to rent one for your kid, uh, you can just add another bike on your account. Right then, they don't have to have a separate account to check out a bike. And they have a they will not go beyond 20 miles per hour. Is that correct? Um, so uh, th th yeah, that was a question exactly. that we had. So. So the, the e-assist bikes, you know, that's been an interesting thing because a lot of the hubbub about the scooters um, and, and the top speeds of the scooters, well, the scooters are actually a self-propelled vehicle. So a sc the scooter will go, is, you know, will just go on its own and go up to a certain speed, whereas the e-assist the e bikes are just that, they're e-assist. So they're not self-propelled. You have to be pedaling. And so what they won't exceed is at, at some point the assist kicks out. So, like, if they're not getting the resistance, then the assist kicks out. And so however fast you could ride a bike 
you could ride the bike, but at that point, it makes no difference that it's an e-bike or not because it's, it doesn't have the resistance that the, e, that the e-assist would kick in. Mm-hmm. And so it doesn't have like a governor that'll hit the brakes if you hit a certain speed, but that speed would be generated by you pedaling real hard versus the e-assist motor helping with mm-hmm. that. So is that at about 20 miles per hour that you're not getting the assist anymore? Yeah. If you're going beyond that, it's human power. If, if, you, if you're going, and, and I think it's, you know, depending on, you know, resistance, if you're going on, it may even be less than that. It's just, it's, you know, resistance dependent. So, yeah, if somebody can crank up the lowest and grade at 20 miles an hour, I suppose they deserve that e-assist. <laughs> e- <laughs> and then, Catherine. and, um, did they let you know how quickly they would be able to redistribute it? And they had a particular word in their field that they called it when they move all the bikes back. I don't remember what that was called, but did they kind of give you an indication of how, how often they do that? Well, so the, yeah, I mean, the, the, their commitment is that they'll keep charged bikes distributed throughout the system. So the idea is that's a daily occurrence, is my understanding, mm-hmm. Becky, is that, and so that's, that they'll, they'll have employees or, or people they contract, contract employees, that that's their responsibility is to grab them, charge them, and redistribute them. And, and the city and the university would be involved in that process of helping them determine, hey, we, need, we, we think we're going to need, especially at launch, X number of bikes here. It would be nice to have X number of bikes here, X number of bikes there. And then the nice thing is the data that's available, which they have also committed to share with the city and with the university, which will really help us understand mobility in our cities and recognize those needs. And so then we can then update the program and say, you know what, these ones aren't seeing very much use, but we're seeing a big demand here because university students like to ride downtown. It's a good access. And so we want some at this point and this point. So that allows us to use that data to better inform the system. Gina? I have a question for you. And and I, I am this nitpicky with my own budget as well. So um, this was not included in our budget this year. And uh, when we were at Transportation Commission the other night, you're looking at maybe an April or May rollout. Is that what the target was? April 1st. Was there any consideration given to waiting until October when our budget starts, or September for that matter, and budgeting this twenty-two dollars or $23,000 in anticipation of this being... We we certainly it, we could do that, I and mean, if that's the direction of the council, that's what we would do. Um, we believe that we can we can accommodate this in the budget. Uh, there is there is a budget line um, that that we've identified that would be likely that we would overrun in the budget line, but we'd have other budgets that we could then supplement that funding. Um, and that's something that we would bring to the council when we brought the specific package forward. If we, you know, if the council was in, in support of the concept, then what the next steps would be would be to get a contract and establish an MOU and get all those documents in place and then come back with how the funding would be proposed. And at that point, the council could look at it and say, yeah, we're in favor or we're not in favor. The the reason that we're bringing this forward when it's not specifically in the budget is that this, this has been <coughs> kind of in flux because the industry has been so in flux and there has been a desire to get a program like this launched. And so we'd like to launch it sooner than next fall um, So because we'd like to you know get people out and get them using it and get gathering the data. And so for the pilot project, uh, we were motivated to see if we could get it funded and, and get it out this spring. Gary, I seen you had a hand up. Do you wanted to? Yes, sir. The authorization tonight is for the council to agree to the concept to authorize moving forward with the project. The, as Tyler indicated, we've identified the public transportation section of non-departmental in the general fund. Twenty-two thousand five hundred dollars is well within the flex of the general fund. I don't anticipate that'll be a problem. We will be bringing it to you uh, when the contract comes through. City attorney will have to take a look at it, and then either will um, recommend bringing it to council. Your authorization tonight is if the standardized contract appears to be sufficient. Then I assume that upon city attorney review, that it would be submitted to the mayor for his signature. Um, council will see the funding. We're asking for authorization to move forward tonight you'll see the official um, opening of the budget in August which is the time when we take all matters that are overruns or unanticipated expenditures and ask for the council to amend its appropriation ordinance at that time so we've gone through the concept we're ready to move ahead Uh, it appeared that the council wanted to move forward with this I know Becky and her folks have been working on this a long time Uh, the risks seem to be fairly small so that's why we encourage it to move forward at this time okay 
Randy? Just for clarification, if someone, when you mentioned leaving it outside of a geofenced acceptable area, uh, I had thought it's possible, but that you may be fined, or is it that you cannot do that? It, so so there, are, there are different structures. There are areas, what, what happens is you, if, if you don't terminate the ride, you'll continue to pay for it. Right. So in a way, you, you do get fined. And then there are other, like, there are places where you can ride it out somewhere, but it's just, it costs you more if you're outside of a service area. So you establish a service area, if somebody rides outside of that, so someone has to go pick that up, then there, there can be charges associated with that, which would be defined in the rate structure. But it's been shown to be a pretty effective way of yeah. preventing bikes from being left when all it, over the place. When, when, when it keeps, you know, racking up the cost, it's a mm -hmm. pretty good motivation to move it to 20 feet and park it somewhere <laughs> that you can yeah. park it. I have one other hey, question Randy. too that there may not be an answer yeah. for this yet. So, uh, can the University of Idaho at any time during this one year pilot decide now we want to take on scooters? Um, so, no interest in doing that okay. <laughs> without the city support. Absolutely. All, all along, it's been we want to go along with the city and have a community wide program that's in alignment with city regulations and rules and and all that um so i don't i don't see us doing that during the pilot period um and then i know you know that i've been interested in this ride share thing too and i know that you've been trying to get some more information from them about that but if we were did have the option to add that during the pilot year and it was something that both entities were mm -hmm. interested in could we do that i believe the option will be there to do it if we want to yeah um i did just see the draft university agreement that was sent to me that just yesterday um and there the option will be there in the agreement mm -hmm. to add them whenever ready so and just bef i, I want to i just want to say that when we originally talked to gotcha they also talked about that they had had a bus and we had part of the vision was then to connect to Pullman, you know, so there's a pretty far-reaching vision that that the city and the university are mm -hmm. thinking about in terms of Gina. those two communities. What happens at the end of the pilot year? So, what would we what we'd anticipate happening at the end of the pilot year is that we would take a good look at the data and the usage. I mean, we'll be looking at that throughout, and then we'll make a decision about how this continues. If this continues, do we? Is it, is it popular enough? Does it merit adding more? Does it, maybe you take some away? Do we, do we add other options? Or do we just say, you know what? It wasn't popular, it didn't work in our community, or we're, we're dissatisfied with the service or the company or whatever else. And so really at that point, we'll be coming back and with a review and I would anticipate a report to council where we come back and say, okay, here's what we've seen and we can show you the statistics and the numbers and then we can, we can make a proposal for what we do moving forward. Do they understand that too? I mean, yes. yeah, gotcha, because I, I hate those moments where you find out it automatically renews for 90 days uh, or whatever. You know, they they, I'm just they very sure. much understand that this is, this, <laughs> is a, this is a pilot program for us, and this is, this is a test of concept. Okay. Jim, we have not heard from you yet. I'm letting all these ladies talk, <laughs> and you haven't had a chance to squeeze in here yet. I can't really get a word in it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very much in favor of this program, and I've been kind of involved in it from the start when we, we did the line bike thing, and it didn't work out. and. Um, I'm very much in favor of I think it's going to do a lot for this community to alleviate parking problems and transportation problems and uh, lower our overall carbon footprint but people moving 100 pounds around instead of 3,000 pounds around so um, uh, at this point I would move to approve entering into an agreement with the University of Idaho and Gotcha Mobility for an e-bike share program and authorize funding from non-departmental public transit item 101, 140, 10, 625-12. Second. Okay, we've got a motion by Jim and a second by Catherine to approve entering into an agreement with the University of Idaho and Gusha Mobility for the e-bike share program and authorize funding from non-department public transit item 101-140-10-625-12. Oh, all good with that. I'll start to roll Brandy. Was there anything that you had wanted? Okay. Only wanted, if I may. I, I just so, noticed that. So is the <laughs> is the direction of the council then that should the contract pass the scrutiny of the city attorney that the mayor's authorized to sign the contract? Was that yes. what you were saying? <laughs> Thank you. That was the intent of the motion. Thank you very much. We good on everything? We are. Okay, we'll start with Brandy. All right, I, I'm going to want to see the data. Aye. 
Aye. Great. Thank okay, you very much. we'll move forward. Well, thank you very much, Becky, Tyler, and Jacob, for being here with us. Okay, we will move on to item number seven. This is exciting. Proposed climate change and carbon uh, fee resolution. Gary Reedner will be presenting. Hi, Gary. How are you this evening? Actually, I'm a little bit stuffed up, so. Well, we'll help you out. gets this microphone after me, it's at their own risk. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Uh, we're here tonight to talk about a resolution uh, that has been championed by a couple of community members. The uh, I can't believe the, or I can't remember the name of the group. Citizens Climate Citizens Lobby. Citizens Lobby. Climate Lobby. Uh, Mary Dupree and Matt Cantrell uh, paid several visits to the mayor over the last couple of months and encouraged uh, him to bring forward a resolution to um, essentially uh, talk about a carbon fee uh, in a way to reduce fossil fuels and reduce carbon um, emissions. Uh, at that time, the mayor was involved in crafting a letter in order to move forward with um, the city's position on uh, the carbon fee and um, carbon reduction. Uh, in the meantime, the city of Pullman passed a resolution in August, very similar to the resolution that you have before you. On November 1st, uh, Steve McGeehan, the chair of the Sustainable Environment Commission, uh, forwarded a letter to Mayor Lambert uh, with a draft resolution uh, requesting that the mayor move it forward to council. Uh, we reviewed the resolution, uh, amended it slightly. Uh, to uh, at least comment on the impacts and encouraging the legislature as it comes up with some sort of carbon fee policy that it also take into consideration that it be transparent, understandable, and that it does not uh, affect the uh, economically disadvantaged. With that, the mayor was comfortable in bringing it forward today. It was presented to administrative committee last week. Uh, Steve McGinn and Mac both presented to administrative committee uh, Steve could not be here tonight. Uh, I've asked uh, Kyle Steele, the staff liaison to the uh, Sustainable Environment Commission, to give you a background. And then um, the mayor, if you'd like to take comment, you're certainly welcome to do that. But that is my presentation. I, I will. You. Let's get Kyle up here. And then when Kyle's done talking, I've got a few words to say, and we'll go from there. Hi, Kyle. How are you tonight? Good evening, Mayor, members of council. <clears throat> um, yeah, just real briefly, as you're aware, um, Citizen Climate Lobby approached the SEC about a year ago, and so we've been working on this proposed resolution for quite a while. Um, they have been working very diligently with uh, the commission and all of you. Um, I think it was in February they introduced a draft, and that got circulated. And through a few iterations, um, they came back in September, <clears throat> the commission approved um, a letter of endorsement to this resolution, so that is before you tonight. And so um, if Mary and Mac would come up. Well, if you um, hang if, on a if, second, I if can If you have any questions for well, them. Well, because I'm going to talk about yeah. them here in a few minutes, yeah. Kyle, when you're done. Yeah, so so just a little bit of background, and, and that's where we're at right now with the resolution. All right. so, yeah. Well, so, um, I've got to say, because it's been quite a while, I guess 10 months, 9 or 10 months, I had the privilege of having Matt Cantrell and Mary Dupree come into my office. We visited a number of different times and talked about all kinds of things. And, and uh, for me at first, one of the things that I told both of them, as I said, I was very interested in the letter, but I wasn't quite sure on a, on a resolution, only because <clears throat> I wanted to find out more information on where it was going, what it, you know who is going to involve can it be fair will it be fair so on and so forth but I was very excited about getting a chance to share with others what we do here in the city of Moscow because uh, there's some major things and multiple things that we do as a city that's really terrific and and Mac and Mary and they promised me they would give me lots of information and Mac flooded me with so much stuff and I read I took a lot of time to read it because it's this is a very important thing. Well, long story short, Kyle, the longer I went and read through this thing, and it's something I told Gary, and Gary and I went back and forth on this letter thing, and finally I said, uh, the resolution makes complete sense to me for the direction we're going. And, and for us in, a, in the state of Idaho, 
I think somebody's got to be able to take some leadership role and move forward with this and encourage other cities in our fine state to go forward with this very thing. And so, but it was with Mac and Mary's uh, consistent, diligent approach with me, and they are very, very cordial when we talk. So we had some good conversations in my office, which I very much appreciate, as well as emails and back and forth and different things, Kyle. So that's where it came from. And so I get those two a huge amount of credit Definitely. for this. Definitely. So. So yeah, I was just going to turn it over the floor to them if you guys had any questions specifically about the resolution or any of the background information that's in your packet. Well, let's get Mac and Mary up. And, and uh, even though this isn't a public hearing, ladies and gentlemen, I plan on taking public comments. So if there's others out there that want to speak, but I'd love to hear from Mary and Mac first. <coughs> and uh, then we'll let others uh, speak as well if they'd like. Thank you all, Mayor, Mayor and City Council members. We've talked to all of you, and we have been very appreciative of your close listening to what we had to say. When we started talking with you a year ago, um, you know, we expressed our concern about uh, the crisis of global warming and the fact that th the city has done a terrific job in many efficiencies, in many ways of controlling um, greenhouse gases, but it's way beyond what we can do as a city or even as a state to deal with this crisis. And uh, that means we felt that we need to communicate our concern to the people who could make a difference in a, in a significant way, and that is our, our legislators at the national level. So we talked about a um, kind of a theoretical concept that, there, that has been going around for a long time and has lots of support, and that was the carbon fee and dividend. Um, it's had broad bipartisan support, which means that we thought it could actually succeed if it were ever introduced in the Congress. Well, as you know, because I think I, I, I sent you a letter a few weeks ago, uh, about 10 days ago, the bill was introduced in the Congress, and it is essentially our bill. Um, the, the one difference, uh, it's a carbon fee, returning 100% of the net dividend to all the American people, um, making border adjustments so that agriculture and other industries are not uh, negatively impacted. Um, uh, in addition to the bill that's been introduced in the Congress is that um, agricultural fuels will be exempted from the program because it's really hard to compensate farmers um, with this kind of a program. And so it, it, I think it acknowledged that, that the agriculture sector is rather unique in its needs. So uh, we're very excited because we think, you know, it's been in introduced in a lame duck Congress, obviously, but it will be reintroduced in um, probably in February in the new Congress. And uh, it's likely that there will be a companion bill introduced in the Senate, we hope by June. So. I, you, you all know all about it because, we, as, as you say, Mac has deluged you with, with, <laughs> with information. So we'd be happy to answer any questions. Mac, come on up and give us a few words of wisdom. Mac, Mac is not short of words. He's, <laughs> he's, for anybody that knows him, and I've got acquainted with this guy over this past year. It's okay. actually been terrific. We've had a good time, haven't we, Mac? It's been right. great. Yeah, yeah. So you guys get an hour? <laughs> no, no. Hey, I've got a time limit I'll put you on here, Mac, so I'll keep an eye on you. So, so this process has really been great, that working with all of you, because, and, and it's not been just us. There, there are a lot of CCL Palouse people here, members of the Palouse group, uh, and, and you've all been involved in this too, as you know, uh, a lot, with, uh, with things leading up to the drafts, with discussions with you folks, with the SEC that's been involved in a major way, and it helped us in a major way. And, one of the things that I think uh, gives me hope is that I see people coming from such diverse backgrounds and with such diverse views and coming together. And this ends up being an issue that really brings people together. And I think it can do that at a national level even. So I think it can make differences beyond just climate change. Um, as far as, uh, as 
this bill is, or as this resolution is concerned, I think there are a lot of reasons uh, that we see that are happening uh, that uh, show us that this is really a good time to do this. Um, it was mentioned that Pullman City Council uh, passed a resolution. Uh, people in Boise are actually waiting for us to pass this resolution. They think it will help them do the same thing. And it gives a real signal to our congressman that something needs to be done. Um, and they listen to that. When, when city government starts saying something needs to be done, uh, legislators start listening more. And we lobby them regularly, and I hear this from these guys when I talk to them. Um, so if you guys approve this this evening, this is really an, an important step made toward letting them know that it's time for things to really be happening. Um, as far as things that are going, other things that are going on, um, I, know, I know some of you were at the uh, PBAC uh, uh, Water Summit in October, and uh, Catherine Roden and Sandra Postel talked about how uh, water problems are going to be increased because of uh, lower snowpacks, the kinds of thing, changes that we're seeing with climate change. So this feeds in to not just people wanting to have unpolluted air, but wanting to have unpolluted water and sufficient water. Um, so it feeds into those things. Boise is uh, pres presently working on a basically a comprehensive plan that would include uh, major considerations uh, for addressing climate change. Um, there are increasing numbers of both liberal and conservative organizations that are pushing for different kinds of carbon fee and dividend policies, uh, tax and dividend, if you want to call it that. Um, of the, and uh, one of those is Americans for Carbon Dividends. Just the last few weeks, ExxonMobil gave a million dollars to them for them to actively push for a carbon fee and dividend system in Congress. So things are ripe to start, to start happening. And for us to be able to put a card into that is really, I think, is really an important thing. I think it's a really, really essential thing. Um, and um, as far as the need for it, uh, if you just look at the congressionally mandated U.S. National Con Climate Assessment that came out about three weeks ago, uh, the story's in there. And the story is that it's, it's a pretty serious thing that we really need to address in many ways. And this is one of the most powerful ways we can do that. So um, I'll cease talking. <laughs> okay, well, thank you, Mac. Questions, uh, uh, yeah. questions for Mac or Mary? Um, yeah. Gina. I haven't had the pleasure of, of conversing with you, Mr. Cantrell, but I have had a, a nice conversation with, with Mary. And I will say that I don't know what you do for your day job, but a motivational speaker might be a good idea <laughs> as a second career, if you, if you don't. Um, be, and it may or may not have been your grandson picture that pushed me, but um, it made me really start thinking. And so on a very microscopic level, it made me start digging into the topic and trying to understand it myself. And it made me dig into my power company too, to see what they were doing and, and where they stand in the whole carbon footprint thing. I was surprised at what I found about Avista. They're in the top 10% in the nation as far as carbon footprints, tiny, tiny little footprints. So it, it's exciting. and. Um, I think that just judging from my own personal experience, this is something I hope catalyzes far more than just Moscow, far more than Idaho, and that we as a nation can get this sorted out because it really is something that will affect both of those babies that we were looking at when we talked. And it's just very important. So it's nice to, it's nice to be able to support it after I did all my own. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Catherine? Um, I you know, I think when we first talked, you said that you had started the the local chapter uh, eight years ago. Could you give a little history? Mary's definitely been in this longer than I have. <laughs> well, I, I really appreciate that in the packet that you gave Marshall yeah. Saunders's information. Yeah, right. Um, I actually uh, joined after uh, there was an organizational meeting <coughs> eight years ago, um, and. Uh, I joined the group uh, as um, it, after the second meeting, and it was basically the fuck. It was you know the the focus of Citizens Climate Lobby is lobbying, and it is um, establishing respectful relationships with people and talking to them mm -hmm. and listening to them. 
about climate change. That's all it really is all about. So what we have to do is we have to talk to people. We have to write letters to the editor. We, each of us, um, many of us have a, a personal relationship with our legislators. Uh, Mac is the representative to um, the liaison to uh, Senator Crapo. He's the only one. And he goes to Washington and talks to him. And he has, and, and these legislators very slowly and their staff pick up the information and they start changing their thoughts about something that many of them originally thought was a political issue. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, Mary, you and Mac are excellent at <clears throat> presenting and talking to people and being smooth about how you say it and do it. You did that with me. Thank and you. Uh, of course I listened to you. And, and I was very interested in it. Uh, to start with, the catch is that so many times people <clears throat> are interested in it, but they really don't know the direction to go. And that you guys have got a great plan. That's one of the great things, and it's easy. It's it's much easier to be optimistic when there's a plan. Yeah. Oh well, yeah. And not not to be fatalistic and saying, "Well, that, <laughs> we can't do anything about this." Exactly. Yep. Yeah. I'd like to move to adopt the resolution. Second. second. I don't know who got the second. Was Brandy it did. Brandy? Okay, we'll go with Catherine. Made the motion. And Brandy made the <coughs> second to approve the resolution, so I'll start to roll with Brandy. Aye. 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 We do have a resolution, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and Mac, Mac and Mary, uh, one of the things, and I'll say to the other folks here, I'm on the board of Association of Idaho Cities, and I had a meeting last month, and I talked to several of them down there, and the president of the council uh, who is uh, our president, her name is Elaine Cleggs. I told her, I said, we were going to get this thing passed. <laughs> and she was very interested in seeing the resolution once it comes. And I said, you will get a copy of it. I'll be going down there again next month. And my fun thing with uh, when we start talking about the Association of Idaho Cities is I'll ask uh, some of the compadres around other cities, other mayors and stuff, when are you going to go ahead and go with this? Don't be afraid. We treaded the water for you by the group up here in Moscow, and so we'll be more than happy to. And if they want someone to talk to, we can get them in touch with the CCL people downstate, too. That, that's so, awesome, yeah. Mac. Yeah. And so we got yeah. that information. It's wonderful. So yeah. cool. thank you for all your hard work you guys yeah. have done. This were awesome. Okay, with that, ladies and gentlemen, we will move on to our next item. Eight, approval of real estate purchase. <coughs> Gary Reedner, you have the floor. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, it's been a long time we've been working on this project. Um, I'm happy to say that we finally have a subject property that we uh, believe will serve the city's purpose as a new police station. So I'd like to just give a little bit of background on it as we're moving forward. Uh, first, in 2014-2015, Council approved a strategic plan which identified several major challenge areas. Uh, one of the main internal challenge areas was a deteriorating substandard police department building in a vulnerable, unsafe location as a major challenge area in the strategic plan. As council knows, the uh, facility has been remodeled over and over. It was the site of City Hall, uh, converted to uh, exclusive police use in the mid 1990s it's located on one-way street the only way south out of the current police station is to go down the alley uh, between Washington Street and Main Street uh, it is a substandard facility does not meet many of the requirements of a modern police facility so council adopted uh, replacement of that facility as one of their priority one uh, internal strategic plan major challenge areas since that time, Council has directed staff to identify 
potential locations for the new police facility. Uh, one of the first that we looked at, and we looked at virtually every facility, every lot in downtown Moscow uh, that was sized right, which was around a little over two acres. Uh, finding that size of lot in, within the city, especially in the downtown area, is problematic. Um, one of the areas that the council focused upon was the current recycling center site, which uh, the strategic plan also identified the current recycling center site as being substandard as well. And uh, the plan was to move the recycling center. So we could have placed police station there, relocated the recycling center, and essentially killed two birds with one stone, as it were. Uh, We'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, subsequently, the federal building currently owned by Gritman Medical Center was also identified as a potential site. And so we spent uh, the better part of a year investigating, assessing that site, trying to determine uh, if it would fit the needs of the city. Of course, it had to come within some uh, reasonable budget. And it took us about a year, but ultimately uh, it turned out that the federal building was not going to be able to meet that need. It was, it was located perfectly. It had access, located in downtown, could have located other city facilities in that same building. However, it was not to be. So we again focused on the recycling center as a potential site. And we started to look at, okay, what is the community's interest in the recycling center? And at that time, council approved a master planning effort in order to look at our sanitation services to make sure that uh, that was the right move. So that's been underway for some time. Concurrently with the undertaking of the master planning process, uh, China has upset the world's recycling markets, uh, refusing to take many of the recyclables that they've taken historically in the past. Uh, since that has happened and since the council's moved to uh, single stream recycling, uh, materials at the recycling center, the single stream at least, are bailed and then held for uh, shipping and sold as a commodity to a um, materials recovery facility. So it was determined that bailing operation could be moved possibly to the site of the uh, transfer station facility east of town, but there still needed to be some manner of collection of commodities as well as the uh, current uh, yard waste drop off in that area. However, because uh, those commodities were going to be reduced because of, of the reduced recycling market, uh, it was determined that uh, perhaps the recycling, center si the recycling center would not have to be moved, but in fact could have been remodeled, could be remodeled on the current site. Uh, council had a workshop on uh, recycling within the last two months. Uh, I've recently been given some additional information by the consultants, which we will be bringing to council uh, to determine which way the council wants to move forward. But uh, the council's direction at that time as a result of that uh, workshop was take a hard look at where the recycling center is located now and is it necessary to move it. So. Again, because we, that didn't solve our police station problem, we still had to look for additional locations. Uh, within the past three months, three potential locations were identified um, and brought to uh, council in executive session. One site was determined to be cost prohibitive. It was just way too much money, fairly centrally located, but um, because it took the consolidation of properties and different property owners, it was determined that it was too expensive and cost prohibitive. So, and because in its location, the response times, meaning the traffic congestion around the site, was determined not to be optimal. So that uh, site was determined not to be optimal and was rejected. The next site was determined that it was available. However, it was uh, near the edge of town and was uh, not centrally located in order to serve downtown uh, areas around town, including the University of Idaho, which uh, we provide police services to as well. So that left one site. This is the site. The site is located along Highway 95. This is Southview. Uh, the Grove Apartments would be in this area. This is Pape Machinery. This is the proposed Myrtle Street. And this is a north, so this is on uh, the 
uh, geez, that was a quick presentation. Uh, <laughs> you shot right through it, Gary. Yeah, it's 2.31 acres. It has good access north-south, good access to the University of Idaho located in this area here, good access east and west, either along Palouse River Drive or up through uh, taking the couplet, taking Highway 8 east, or, <coughs> excuse me, turning on 3rd Street and going west. So good circulation around the site as well. Uh, it's Lot 1, Block 2 of the Indian Hills 9th edition, which Council approved several years ago at the time that the uh, Grove Apartments were approved. Located in the map of the city, it's right here. As I said, the University of Idaho located in this area, Central City here downtown. Uh, good access along these corridors north, south, east, west, so on and so forth. So uh, it isn't as centrally located to downtown as we would like, but as I indicated, we've looked at virtually every and pursued virtually every property uh, within downtown proper. And as you might expect, downtown real estate is extremely expensive. Uh, certainly didn't want to raise any buildings or anything like that. So uh, that's why we focused on these properties. This is uh, an overhead photograph of the property. As you can see, it's this much of, you can see uh, Pape machinery down here. This is the parking lot for the Grove Apartments. The new Edible Forest Park is in this area up here. So Highway 95 here. This is a photograph looking east um, as you overlook the site. As you can see, there's fill on the site, which was placed there uh, when the Grove Apartments were constructed. That's one of the things that we will be looking at uh, as we do our due diligence on the site. This is a site um, looking from, what is it, Bill, the north? How you're looking, looking from the north and the north uh, westerly uh, from uh, Southview or, yeah, south. South View, God dang, I tell you. It's like I've got cotton in my head. Anyway, uh, so this is looking toward Highway 95. Uh, I got to give credit to Bill Belknap for these striking photo photographs. Uh, great job. This is, this is on the site what a potential um, layout of the site would look like. This is essentially the same footprint of the uh, police station that was uh, designed to go on the recycling center property. Uh, it was set up that uh, it meets the needs, as you know, that uh, preliminary design or concept design uh, was uh, through the efforts of a working group that included uh, Bill led that working group. We had uh, the police, building department, other folks work on that. So this footprint will meet the needs of the police department. They also have a storage building here. They've got uh, secured parking and they've got uh, a public parking area as well. This is not necessarily what the site will end up looking at. I uh, have to go out and make sure that uh, the footprint works, but it is the purpose for this exercise was to make sure that a facility of that magnitude would fit on the site, and it does. This is again from an elevated uh, south easterly looking. Uh, you can see south view again, 95. This is what an elevation would look like. So again, conceptual in nature uh, as the uh, proposal moves forward, as we obtain financing for the project, then actual design would proceed. Uh, also, um, Myrtle Street has not yet been constructed. It will be constructed as part of this project. There is a detention basin located in this area of the property as it is now. As part of the agreement, we have the property owner. That detention basin will be removed from the property so we will be able or relocated off the property so we will be able to utilize the entire site. So the proposed purchase, I've put a copy of a couple of documents on at your desks. Um, and the reason that this was added to the agenda on Friday afternoon, uh, Bill has done just yeoman-like service in working with all property owners in all potential sites. Uh, it took a long time to get this uh, put in a position where we could bring a proposal forward. We did not want to bring it forward until we actually had a signed uh, purchase and sale agreement. So. You have that before you tonight. You also will notice that you have another document <coughs> that 
which is <clears throat> an acknowledgement of an advice of rights because we are a government <coughs> uh, the city does have the right of eminent domain or the authority of eminent domain meaning that they can uh, take property uh, pay market value for it but can designate that property as necessary for public uses uh, because that might put a chilling uh, effect on negotiations uh, you need to let uh, property owners you're dealing with potential <laughs> sellers know that you at least have that authority not that you're going to exercise it and certainly it was not exercised in this case this is a um, arm's length transaction as we like to say in the law meaning that we had a willing buyer and a willing seller the offer that is in contained in the purchase and sale agreement before you there's a 90-day feasibility period to assess the site the facility fit which is what we just talked about making sure that that building or one like it can fit on the site and the potential uses can be um, fit on the site soil conditions we talked a little bit about the fill on the property and then we need to check on the condition of title the title needs to be passed to the city through warranty deed which means that the owner is making sure that they own the property and they will defend the title if we purchase it uh, relocation of that existing stormwater detention facility to remove it from the property and make more of the property available for development completion of the construction of Myrtle Street from South View to East Palouse River Drive by October 31st 2019 is an additional condition uh, the commitment to construct Myrtle Street was part of the uh, Indian Hills ninth uh, subdivision so uh, we're just making sure that that is constructed as well that's another way for uh, the police to access Palouse River Drive without entering onto Highway 95 so that is a, a uh, condition as well <coughs> excuse me uh, there's an extended closing through June of next year because as uh, City Council is directed and as is noted in the strategic plan uh, this project will take uh, several millions of dollars uh, that we do not have in our general fund which is where these funds would come from so it's proposed that there will be a May general obligation bond election and so that will occur on May 21st of 2019 uh, we have set the date two other times because of the complications the uh, multiplicity of properties that we looked at and then the issues with uh, developing those properties we've not gone ahead with the bond issue I would note just for uh, the sake of information that the city has no outstanding general bond obligations at this time the city has the capacity to issue up to 21 million dollars of uh, general obligation debt uh, the city has no general obligation debt at this time the only bonds that uh, the city is indebted to pay are bonds for uh, the uh, sewer uh, water reclamation and reuse facility upgrades uh, so uh, cities in good financial shape the stewardship of the council has been very good about uh, making sure that uh, debt is not incurred when it is not necessary and the council has decided in this case it is necessary purchase price is eight hundred seven thousand six hundred fifty six dollars for two hundred two point three one acre parcel that's a hundred thousand nine hundred fifty seven square feet uh, I believe that's eight fifty a square foot bill eight eight dollars a square foot thank you what did I just do oh. sorry about that too many buttons on this thing okay the five thousand dollar deposit is uh, will change hands as the council approves the agreement there's a 90-day feasibility period to assess the feasibility of the site as I explained in the last slide title review will occur historical use review that's a phase one environmental go back through the documents to make sure that nothing nasty has occurred on the site it hasn't been a landfill or anything like that a geotech assessment this is where you test the uh, buildability if you will of the fill to make sure that it can support development and a structure if not then there may be some alternate construction methods that we need to look into uh, site fit assessment again we talked about whether the program of development of the property will fit on the site or whether there need to be alterations and then within that feasibility period the council or the city can terminate the purchase and sale agreement 
and the seller will refund that $5,000 deposit. It's just a show of good faith on behalf of the city that we are serious in proceeding. Because the property is under contract, the sellers will not be free to sell it. They'll have to take it off the market during uh, the duration of this purchase and sale agreement until the city ultimately purchases the property. Continuing on, assuming that uh, feasibility is confirmed and is successful, we can proceed toward closing. The deposit then, then becomes an option payment. So instead of just a good faith payment to show that we're moving forward, <coughs> it becomes an op option to purchase payment and becomes non-refundable at that time. So if the city chooses not to proceed with the contract, then the seller will be able to uh, take the $5,000 and the city will forfeit that $5,000 property will be held under contract through the bond election. Again, what that means is the city has exclusive rights to it. So when the bond election is successful, we will close. City will have 30 days after the bond election date to proceed to closing, whether or not the bond election uh, is successful. The reason for that is to give the council flexibility, uh, but we wanted to make sure that there was no language in the PSA that said the bond absolutely has to be successful. Council may choose to go another route, may choose to purchase the property anyway. Uh, we've not explored that, but we wanted to keep all the options open for the council to consider. Upon closing, one half of the sale proceeds will be placed in an escrow account and the sellers will have to construct Myrtle Street uh, in accordance with the contract. Those escrowed funds will be dispersed in three equal installments, one at the start of construction of Myrtle Street, one at the 50% completion, and one at 100% completion and accepted acceptance of those improvements by the city. Um, as we would with any street. Those improvements must be completed by October 31st, 2019. Okay, with that, a uh, lot of information. Again, I wanna thank Bill for his efforts and, and of course the seller's representatives of as well. Uh, it's a big move for the city. This is, we've had several successes with our strategic planning initiative, including being able to purchase fire trucks and several other things that have gone on. Uh, this is a big move ahead. The police station has been inadequate for a long time. Council recognizes that. Um, I remember when uh, the strategic plan was approved, uh, <coughs> council said that we've been talking about this for 20 or 30 years, now's the time to move ahead. So staff's recommendation is that the purchase and sale agreement meets all the needs uh, that we can find, and it's set up to uh, provide the opportunity to have a police station, um, a new police station in Moscow. So we recommend approval. Questions for Gary from council? I have a question. Catherine? Um, I know it's not part of this contract, but we keep talking about the bond. So can we say what the bond amount would be at this point? Well, we still need to update numbers. We anticipated the bond would be somewhere around $10 million. As you recall, what the bond that we uh, had talked about moving forward with, the police station is one element of this. Uh, we'd started out when we started talking about bonds that we would maybe have some street construction in the bonds. We may have some park development, may have some downtown development so on and so forth. Uh, it was determined that uh, because of the way Idaho bond laws are, that you have to have separal, separate questions about the different types of activities or projects you're going to move forward with a bond. For instance, if you have streets and buildings in the same bond, you would have to ask separate questions. So that creates confusion. So yes, I want streets, no, I don't want the building, or yes, I want the building, or no, I don't want streets. Either way, half your bond is going to fail. So the idea was to try and make it as simple, easy to understand as possible. <coughs> so we talked to bond council, talked to our financiers, and that was the, that was the uh, recommendation. So this bond would take care of three needs of the city. First is the relocation and construction of a modern uh, police facility that meets all the requirements. 
Second would be the 4th Street facility that the police occupy at this point could then be renovated to take care of some of the space needs that we have in the city right now. It's anticipated that likely the community development and public works uh, engineering departments would be relocated to that site. That would take renovation to do that as well. Because it's a cascading effect, uh, as community development and engineering left the man building, the man building has been assessed. It is in good shape. Uh, it needs some renovations, but structurally it is sound. We had a structural engineer take a look at it. And so that building could be remodeled as well in order to house other city needs such as the information systems department. We also have a real issue with storage in the city. Uh, we have storage in the basement of City Hall. We have every nook and cranny, every closet stuffed with records. Uh, so we need secure storage that is under the jurisdiction of the city clerk, the building department, so on and so forth. So part of the man building could be used for that. You'll also note at last council meeting, council approved a uh, lease for the American Insurance Building just across 3rd Street from City Hall. That lease was... Uh, was for a term of three years. It was designed to have a term for three years because if all of this falls together, the bond is successful, the police station is constructed, 4th Street facility is constructed in, I believe that's 2021 when that would be constructed, then the folks who would be across the street and the folks in the current man building would take up the residence in the 4th Street facility. And the last element, the last leg of the stool, if you will, would be the renovation of the man building. So it's all designed to try and put these chess pieces in place so that the uh, future um, housing needs of city services are taken care of within the next three years. Gina? In the spirit of asking nitpicky <coughs> financial questions, do we have um, the feasibility study steps, all of those little pieces? that you listed out, are they budgeted somewhere already? Meaning feasibility, the, um, oh. Like the geo. The geotech yeah. and the, the yeah, think. all of that. Yeah, so. we have, it's anticipated that they will be expended from general fund capital. This is a general fund capital project. We have general fund capital accumulations. Okay. Again, because we don't know how much they would be. We have a little amount of money in different planning buckets around the city. Uh, but likely what we will do is bring those forward to you in an open budget process in August, uh, doing the same things that we do. Okay. Thank you. Um, the timing with um, Myrtle Street uh, improvement has to be done by the end of October. Would that mean that nothing could move forward on that site until that's completed, or can, can things get underway before that? Yeah, things would get underway, and Bill, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, there's access off of Southview, so there could be construction on the site as Myrtle Street is being constructed, and if they get it done quick enough before development starts, but we anticipate that uh, development will occur the end of 2019 and into 2020, if I recollect correctly. Go ahead, Bill. Uh, <laughs> so if we're at a bond election in May mm -hmm. and not knowing the outcome of that, moving forward, the design is probably about a four-month window. So we're probably not bidding this until the winter of 2019 with the construction to begin in the spring of 2020. Um, so if, if Myrtle's completed, then in the fall of 2019, that's well in advance of construction activities that we would have on the property. Okay. Got it. questions for Gary and again if I was con didn't mean to confuse anyone it is anticipated that the proceeds of the bond will be utilized to fund the purchase of this property which is why closing is not until June 30th of 2019 after the bond is is elected is there uh, I'm curious have you have at what point did I'm assuming talking to the police about this location, or is this the first time that no. they're here, hearing <laughs> this as your surprised. potential well, new Chief spot? Chief Rye can speak for himself. But <laughs> yeah, every one of the sites that we have considered have been submitted to Chief Fry and his staff oh, right. uh, because 
flow, access, uh, response times, all of those things uh, are very important. In fact, we had some sites that fell off the table because maybe the traffic patterns weren't such that uh, you could get in and out. There was a site, uh, for instance, the old Dumas site was one that was looked at fairly early on. It was a developable site about the size that could work. However, access was mostly onto A Street. There were residential streets to the south and to the east. So police cruisers responding to emergencies down residential streets um, going in and out all the time probably wasn't a great idea so that was even though it was a big enough site fairly <coughs> centrally located did not work and and the chief and his staff were engaged at every every turn right so they're in favor of i think this site will work for their needs and yeah yes, we do. Okay. well your honor i um I'll make a motion. Let's approve the uh, real estate purchase agreement. Okay, second. Okay, we've got a motion by <coughs> Gina and a second by Catherine to uh, approve the purchase and sale agreement. Do we have to be specific problem. about the, which agreement it is? The agreement that is in front of you. So just saying that it's... The one that has been distributed. Yep, okay. The one that's been distributed and signed, Catherine. We're all good. I'll start with Brandy. Aye. 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 Okay, we will move forward with it. Thank you very, very much. That ends our regular agenda, so we will go right into reports, and I'll start with you, Gina. Okay. Um, I was uh, dealing with the death of a dog on the same night as the volunteer fire department, but I did follow up with the fire department, and they are working currently, and I'll have some pictures soon, on our second fire engine nice. remember we have another one coming and so they um, it is in process it is being built we anticipate June arrival of the new engine and having been one who was lucky enough to ride in our current new one it was pretty awesome so try to find a way to have a council field trip or something I think would be nice I also um, had a rabble rousing fun time at the um, Transportation Commission and um, they they elected new officers. They um, had some commission communications. They received the Gotcha Bike uh, um, program uh, from Tyler and from Becky, and they too were in favor of this of this uh, program. So it was nice to see some some commonality there. They also um, discussed the Third Street pedestrian bridge and recommended that uh, the northernmost um, placement of the pedestrian bicycle bridge. And that, that, that was quite a lengthy conversation. And, and um, it's interesting in that, that commission, they all are very um, different in their opinions and everything. But then when they get down to making the decision, it's, it's like magic. So um, and that's, that's all I did. OK, Jim. Yeah, it, will transportation be bringing that to committee at the next uh, available committee meeting? I Public understand it will be January. Well, it'll have to be because we're right. canceled. This is the next one, right, right. Right. In January. Oh, I guess it is Christmas yeah. next week. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah. yep. Okay. Okay, yeah. <laughs> uh, I really don't have anything to report. The uh, PBAC uh, uh, Communications Committee was postponed until this week, and I have human rights tomorrow, so um, I'm right. out of information. All right. Brandy. Uh, I had the Pathways Commission met, and um, the majority of what was discussed was uh, what the Pathways Commission thinks about e-bikes and um, their use on pathways, because that is not in our code. It's not defined. So there was some looking at uh, how those definitions and um, codes are in Boise, and they the the request that they come up with a recommendation to present to us for what they think about these e-bikes on pathways. There's a lot of discussion about the different um, classes of e-bikes and speeds and pedestrian safety and, and possible signage and lots of great ideas that I think they're going to continue to hammer out and, and get to us in a concise form for us to consider how, how these this technology will apply to pathways in our city. Okay. Catherine. 
Well, um, our city is picking up recycling and I have received a notification that I had contaminated recyclables. I'm going to <laughs> is that what that means? <laughs> and I'm not proud of this. I'm going to blame my husband. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> who claims to be a scientist and so I said the list is short so this weekend I will be going through the recyclable box and redoing this but the reason I brought this is because I really appreciated that our city has taken the time to continue to work on educating uh, the residents about um, what we can recycle and what we can't recycle and um, there are plastics that can be recycled um, there is number two and four um, that's not on this list that can be recycled um, in the TREX program, and you can drop those off um, at Moscow Charter School and other businesses, and um, WinCo and Safeway are collecting f to get these sent out. So we can continue to recycle because we are a community who wants to do that. So this, I'm actually I, 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 I'm embarrassed that we got it, but I'm proud that the city's you know, educating us more. <laughs> then I also um, went to the Moscow Arts Commission meeting, and like a lot of the other commissions, they ha had elected their officers. Um, they are working very diligently on a strategic planning document, and uh, it has so much to do with the public art and so many things that our community does to, to raise awareness of art, and so they are very dedicated people um, in that area and they are looking for two more commission members there's two seats open and um, that would be really helpful so if you know someone to contact um, uh, contact uh, Lori McCleary she's the chair and then um, the new um, manager of the arts department it's not called arts department anymore the manager of the arts organization part it's been split between the community community which is Amanda Argona who does farmers market and all that stuff and then arts um, Megan Cherry she came and so she's trying to put together a prospectus so that people will know um, what to do when there is uh, like a request for art and all that kind of thing so we can get people to be more involved in creating art and so um, they actually have um, art walk there's already a call for artists for all mm -hmm. art walk and that selection is going to be February 1st so again they were really trying to get the word out if you know an artist that's interested um, please have them submit for art walk okay on December 10th we had a MIAC uh, meeting in this very room and what that is is a mayor's youth advisory council and we had a big discussion with the kids about fundraising and two things came up uh, for those kids to learn how to raise funds and, and one was being able to uh, help folks that needed help hauling off a used Christmas tree once it was done and take it into the recycling center and or snow removal uh, contributions for those folks that struggle having their sidewalks or driveways clean and stuff um, being able to do that type of work and help somebody out through the snow season and that's kind of timely because we've had I know Murph wrote an article about it here uh, this past week and we've the city has notified folks about you know um, what they every one of us as residents needs to do with our own sidewalks and of course and we've been fortunate because we really haven't had much snow but it is coming I understand this next weekend but before the kids can actually do this we're checking out the liability issues on it so it's not our problem so uh, but it's kind of a neat thing for these kids to learn how to do this stuff and their the civic side of things that they're learning to do is really terrific and so I uh, will be uh, my advisor Brandon Allen and I will be out there with snow shovels as well helping these kids get them going taking a leadership role with it so it'll be kind of fun but uh, that's all I have Gary do you have anything for us just want to comment we had a very successful employee <laughs> holiday potluck last Thursday a uh, great time was had by all um, kind of a pre-Christmas dinner it was great uh, lots of fun so appreciate uh, everybody who came to that uh, certainly all the elected officials who came as well uh, with that I want to remind the public that they do have responsibility for uh, cleaning their sidewalks so please make sure a lot of people walk in this community and keeping those clear <laughs> really helps people move around uh, City Hall will be closed of course on the 24th and 25th of December just wanted to do announce that as well okay. so that's all I have thank you and we will not have an executive session tonight council so with that I would entertain a, a motion to adjourn 
So moved. Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? We'll close at 838. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Have a nice evening. Merry Christmas, all. Merry Christmas. It did sound like we were wanting to.